Welcome to GDC. We're at uh, another live person event. It's very exciting. Human corporeal form. It's, uh, uh, it's refreshing, uh, isn't it's it? It's novel. <laughs> um, so, Jeff, well met, first off. Nice to meet this you, is, too. It, it, not a lot of these am I meeting the person literally, essentially, as we sit down to yeah, do this. Yeah. But that's a, it's always a real pleasure because rather than asking questions that I sort of secretly know the answer to, but for the benefit of future listeners, I'm kind of teeing up things. Mm. I, I, I genuinely know almost nothing about you. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to learn, and hopefully anybody listening will enjoy the ride along with hopefully. me. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... You are one of those people that I find very frustrating because you have a lot of talents and you do a lot of different things and, and wear mm. a lot of different hats. And that's always intimidating um, as someone who's very mono sort of thematic in his skill set. Um, so I, I kind of just wanted to start from the from the basics. And since you do, you know, since you do a lot of things, that mm -hmm. means clearly where you are today is probably a lot of different life threads that have kind of come together to form this 2022, you know, version of you. Yeah. And I, and I'm just curious where that traces back to, like, for example, you know, growing up, um, mm. how did you discover what put you on the path is probably the better way to phrase it towards this yeah. kind of work. I would say probably my, my old man, uh, mm. Ralph, Ralph. So, um, my dad, uh, used to work for Roland, um, and they hired him because he invented a sequencer, uh, wow. which uh, became uh, the Roland Microcomposer. Um, and he invented this stuff in the early 70s. Um, and what, what was the context by which he invented? Like he, so, okay, he, the context was that he was um, really into electronics. He was also a jazz musician. Um, and he combined the two in, yeah. a, in a, to a degree and, uh, pretty high level. Yeah. Uh, so it's like, it's one thing to be a jazz musician and sort of dabble in technology, but he obviously really knew what he was doing, he knew from, what a, he was from, doing. from a tech or an engineering maybe standpoint. Yes. Yeah. And, and a musical standpoint too, which is really interesting. Like, like he really understood jazz and, but he also really understood, um, low level electronics, and then eventually, actually, he went into programming and stuff. So he was wow. really down that path. And uh, so he, you know, there's no surprise I was inspired by it. Where is this uh, happening, by the way? Where did you grow up? In Vancouver, Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, uh, you know, he would go to recording studios in Vancouver and do sessions. Uh, as, so, a, as a, like a musician? As, like a, a, session as a session player. Wow. Um, and then, of course. Playing what? Uh, he would play uh, vibraphones, um, Rhodes, piano, uh, occasionally accordion, um, <laughs> glockenspiel. I saw Basically whatever do. was needed that day. Yeah. I mean, it was all kind of keyboard oriented instruments, but, you know. Um, well, but, but you know, ballet all percussion is kind of its own specialty. So mm. to just kind of casually toss that in there. Yeah. Is, yeah. Definitely so, knows what he's doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, yeah, he did. And, and um, um, so he would uh, take me along with him to these sessions. Uh, as a young lad, and I would watch these seasoned veteran musicians just looking at charts and, you know, one or two takes and just nail it. <laughs> and it was just so impressive. And I loved the camaraderie of the musicianship. It's the best. Um, I was fascinated by engineering and the studio and the tape machine. Occasionally they would let me be the tape op, <laughs> no, that's which awesome. was a lot of fun, you know, and, and, um, and then, you know, and through, through that, like, cause my dad started working for Roland, he started doing like trade shows and going to the NAM show. And mm. then he started meeting people like Toto <laughs> and Michael Jackson and, and different people and becoming like uh, a tech guru for some of these people. Uh, uh, several times I went down to LA uh, with my dad to hang out with him while he was working with Toto. He, he actually worked on Toto 4 on that, that album with Rosanna and Africa and all that. Wow. And, and uh, they credited him as um, special thanks to uh, Ralph, Shirt, Simple, Dyke. And, <laughs> uh, and the reason why they said that is because they would say, hey, uh, Ralph, we need, our, uh, we need our prophet to talk to our Oberheim, you know, and make him layer up and to, you know, pre-MIDI. Yeah, so, exactly. And he'd go, sure, it's simple, you know, and he'd make some little interface box for them that connects one keyboard to another. So 
Um, again, I, I was watching a lot of this happen. And that's a real I, unicorn in those days. Somebody yeah, who could do that. Yeah. He may be like the one, the, literally the person who could. Not, yeah. not even a class that's small, but just yeah. that he was, guy. <laughs> he was a very uh, unique individual. Sounds like and, it. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I suppose... Um, uh, do you, I just got so inspired you? by that. It, sorry to cut That's you off. Right. I'm just, I'm just. Uh, the thing that is so cool about that is sometimes parents will bring their kids along to these kinds of things. Just it could range anything from pragmatic necessity of well, there's no babysitter lined up, so you you got to come with me to work. Yeah, yeah. All the way to you know, I want them to, I want to plant a seed with them. Mm. You know, and mm. like I'm actively there. This is a this is a deliberate exposure to a thing that may really set mm. them down a path. Did you have a sense of any where you were? And it was, it was, like, was he hoping that you would gravitate towards this kind of thing? Or was it more just, hey, I'm going to do a cool thing. You want to come watch? Yeah, probably more the latter. You know, like I don't think he had any grand plans for me to do this. Uh, you know, and also you got to remember... Like, it's obviously really hard to make it in the music biz. So, part, well, partly why I asked. A yeah. lot of parents kind of actively discourage it because exactly. they, it's like they're trying to spare their kid the Yeah, look, I've, I actually discouraged my daughter. <laughs> yes. And she went to uni to study music production, and she's already starting to work in games. So, <laughs> Well, then let's create the mythology that he, he wouldn't have wanted you either so we can have a multi-generational failure mm -hmm. Uh, process yeah. of discouragement that is then followed by success yeah. from the rebellion, the rebellion uh, offspring. Um, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, because it's because it's amazing. I mean, the fact that you would have a front row seat to such a high level mm. of the business. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like living. I live in Los Angeles, and mm -hmm. every now and again, you know, most people who live there don't live there. They're not from there, I should say. Yeah, yeah. And so they, um, you know, have their stories all begin. Oh well, you know, I. In Boston, I was the only one who wanted to do this. Or in mm. Denver, I grew up in Denver, you know, a lot, mm. a lot of that kind of thing. Um, but every now and again, you meet an Angelino who actually mm. is from there. And they're mm. always this kind of novel creature. Right, right. And, but every, you know, a good number of them, you know, you'll hear these stories where they grew up, you know, just on movie sets or mm. at the scoring yes. stages or whatever. And yeah. I always thought, I can't even fathom the impact on my childhood. It, in a way, I'm almost glad I didn't have it because... I think it would be so easy to not fall in love with it, to see it as that's just normal, mm. banal life stuff that, or yeah. like that's mom and dad's work. That's not interesting, exciting. Mm, like, mm. And, and cause to all the outsiders, these things have a mystique, you know, where you just think I get to go to a city where they actually record music there. Mm. Like, this is mm. mind blowing. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's cool that I love that, that you kind of somehow got the best of both. You got exposed to, you know, there's not much above, you know, especially for that time period, you know, mm -hmm. Toto's and Michael Jackson's, mm -hmm. though, but where do you go? It's not like mm -hmm. scrounging around with a bunch of sort of B-listers, as it were. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like, so you got this dose that's unbelievable, yeah. and yet it actually caused a spark and not a it did. rebellious no, child. I, I don't, don't want to do anything to do with music. Yeah, and I, I, I think I saw him doing it, and I thought, I, I can do that. I, could, I think I could do that. Um, and I do, in a, in a, I do a subset of what he did. Uh, definitely, I'm not a jazz musician, and um, my programming is super rusty. <laughs> and, Fair enough. You know what I mean. But I, it was more like, okay, I th I think I can. I think I'm. Well, look, I I, I thought I was just going to give it a go, you know. And I and I see that in my daughter too. She does. She's gone. She's seen me um, doing what I do, and she goes, I can do that. You know. Yeah. She's, she's inspired by it, which is really cool. Yeah. Well. Mm. So then, how do we? Let's try to close the gap between then and and now where okay. um, cuz you first got into games you know give or take 20 years ago, mm -hmm. right? So yep. what what led to that first entry point? Especially cuz 20 years ago is very different landscape than yeah. today in terms of entry points for people. So what what yeah. was yours? That was one of those luck moments, I think. Uh, a friend of mine saw an ad in a free employment paper. Uh, <laughs> Is it in Van Vancouver still? In Vancouver. Uh, it was Electronic Arts looking for an audio programmer. And, and I, at the time, was, you know, spinning my wheels in, in various pop bands trying to make it and was not getting anywhere. What, what, what's your instrument? My instrument is keyboard. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And, uh, and... Yeah, so, so I, just I, living I, the life of a gigging musician. Oh yeah, yeah, and and starving, 
you know, was not doing well. <laughs> Famously, um, that is, that you is know. the default position. <laughs> yeah. that line of work. But I mean, look, my, the thing I was into was I, you know, I was down with early MIDI sequencers and samplers and synths and programming. And, you know, my dad was making uh, MIDI sequencers on computers now. And, you know, I was understanding that. And I had uh, played around with enough recording equipment that I knew how to produce music, um, you know, in the sort of sort of early composer form of it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as I was learning, getting my chops. And, um, but, you know, I was lucky I uh, was in a b band that had... Um, a song on the local radio that was getting a little bit of airplay, you know. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I went and applied for this audio programmer job, even though I'm not a programmer. And uh, and it was just to get my foot in the door, you know, because I, I thought maybe if I go there and show off all my stuff that I can do, that maybe maybe they'll just take me on anyways. This is really how I went in but there. But to you get know? your foot in the door with an eye towards achieving what with that? Um, I wanted to do video game audio. I was playing um, NHL hockey on the Sega Genesis with my friends, you know, I and, I see. So, you yeah, know, was... and I, and I could tell, oh, okay, well, there's obviously a little MIDI sequencer in there and there's a synth and stuff. And I can do this. I could do, I think I could actually do better than what, what the EA did <laughs> on there. Right. And so, um, I went in for the job interview and met some other audio people that were there. And I connected with all of them quite nicely, but then I was put into a room full of programmers and they started uh, grilling me on my programming ability. And I basically said, well, yeah, I don't really know how to do that, but I'm, I'm really good at learning on the job. So maybe one of you guys could like, just give me a bit of a, uh, uh, a bit of help when I need to like program a driver or something. And um, anyway, so I went home and the next day I got the uh, thanks, but no thanks letter. Um, <laughs> No big surprise. And I was really bummed because I thought, wow, that was the moment. That was the moment that was going to be like, that was going to be how I get into the something, point, the turning yeah. point. And I really felt that I missed it. And I was really bummed out. And two weeks later, they phoned me back and they said, hey, you know, you're not a, clearly not a good programmer, but would you like to come on board and help us with sound effects on a hockey game? And I <laughs> went, yeah. And then like two weeks later. A Canadian interested yeah. in hockey? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, two weeks later, I'm now hired. They've put me into an office with a beautiful view of the mountains in Vancouver. I've got, <laughs> I've got this thing called a Macintosh, which I'm like, what the hell is this? Uh, crazy har Sega Genesis hardware uh, development kits and stuff like uh, that. Yeah. And I'm making sound effects in, in an FM synth. And I'm, you know, then they're starting to say, hey, can you write music? And I'm like, yeah. And then I wrote some music on a game called Skitchen. And, and uh, uh, I had to pinch myself to go, am I dreaming? Because this is exactly what I wanted to be doing. Yeah, that you know, foot in the door a, that you were looking for, you kind yeah. of shortcut the... Yeah, you somehow shortcut around the thing that was supposed to be the paying your dues yeah. portion. Ex well, yeah, I mean, like, I feel like I paid my dues trying to do it in the pop scene but I just you know mean, what i mean yeah you, you but know, at that, EA, that gamble you're yeah, making of yeah. like i'll get in on this thing and kind of work my way towards yeah well i, I guess want. actually a, a a classic way of getting into games is going into the Q, qa right of course you know and and testing and then showing the devs that you know how to do something and then they might take you in but yeah i bypassed that and, and in fact yeah. the, the funny thing is that as a tangent on that i i keep hearing more and more sort of whispers that that's in, that's increasingly sort of not true because QA departments, the big ones, that's such specialized work. And to be able to really effectively QA a game has gotten mm. so complicated that yeah, it's not true. really entry level work anymore the yeah. way it used to be. Uh, you know, yeah. like just play the game, report bugs. It's like, no, you got to really, yeah. really know. And it helps to have somebody that that's kind of their passion. You know, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. just one of those funny things that just in the same way that, you know, you're brought on, can you just do some sound effects? And it's mm. kind of like, Oh, by the way, I guess we could use some music. And now mm. it's, you know, the, the the world of composing is so elaborate and yeah. so complicated. And the That's vetting true. process is often very elaborate. Mm. And, but true. in any case, all right. That's so you true. were you were writing music uh, and you were doing sound effects. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and where, how long did that last? What was So I was at EA for about five years, from 92 to 97. Were you gigging during that time also? I was actually, yeah. Yeah, I was in a, I had a, a progressive rock band at that point uh, called The Heavy Lounge. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we were all um, just getting more into that sort of 
progressive thing. Primus was really popular at the time and the grunge thing. So this was like a combination of all those sort of things. So I was playing, uh, I was composing at work um, and uh, I was composing and I was doing sound design and implementation. It was all very technical and I was just loving it. Uh, the games I worked on was a lot of like, uh, I did a lot of EA sports stuff. A lot of the very first version of of franchises that went are still going. So like mm -hmm. I, I did the very first uh, FIFA and and, wow. and first couple of FIFAs and um, it's for, crazy how long those games. Oh, I know they're going. still going. I mean NHL is it's in, like the Simpsons, you know. Yeah, it season is. forty. It, you know exactly. <laughs> it's exactly like that. You know, it's crazy. These are still going and um, and it was amazing to be there at the beginning and you know obviously <laughs> the games are completely different now. Oh, yeah. You know because of the technology, but not to mention that FIFA has become like as or more famous for its music licensing as a yes. as a kind of almost like a tastemaker yeah. venue now it's, it yeah. is, has become in so many ways what before was you know the record label executives whose job is to kind of decide who gets to hear what and they make the hits as a result you know yeah, they're the yeah, one yeah. deciding this is going to be the thing we send to the radio i feel like fifa in particular seems to have that kind of mystique of this is a game that people no, they're going to hear yeah. music they've never heard and it's yeah. going to have all these artists that's like what launches their career especially in the yeah. world of like hip hop and, and it's, it's it's true it's it, it's really interesting the way that's apart turned. from what you're talking about well and in interestingly in 97 is when ea said oh we're going to start licensing music mm -hmm. and i went see ya <laughs> right that's one of, that was my cue to get out of there because i didn't not i didn't want to become you know part of the team that's you know, working licensing. A music I, I, want, type, yeah, yeah. I just didn't want to do that. I wanted to be the guy writing. Also, I, you know, after five years of writing sports themes and stuff, I was like, okay, I think I need a bit of diversity in my composition. Sure. Um, and so, uh, interestingly, uh, I had married an Australian named Angela. Uh, she worked at EA as well. And hmm. we lived in Vancouver for a while, but she was getting pretty tired of the rain in Vancouver <laughs> as it rains there a lot. And she wanted to move back to Australia and I uh, tagged along and we, we, I moved to Australia with her. Um, and just, you know, in, I was at that point in my life where it's like, I should, I should do a big move like this and just try something different. Yeah. It's uh, never going to be easier probably. Exactly. You know, like if, if things fall apart, I'm, I can pick up the pieces from this, you know, easily. Um, and I went down there and interestingly, by going down to Australia, I somehow met the right people and became involved with Creative Assembly. Creative Assembly, who are in the UK and are responsible for the Total War series. Oh, yes, I know. Wow. Um, yeah, and so I, um, interestingly, they were doing EA Sports stuff before they did Total War. And that was actually, it was that EA Sports overlap mm, that, I was that gonna got say, me how in. Do you, you how know do you what I mean? Move you know, the exact wrong direction relative to the UK and yeah. then land yeah. in their lap, so to exactly. speak. Exactly. And, and what it was is that EA Australia wanted um, Australian sports games. So rugby, AFL. Yeah, like the crocodile yeah. wrestling. Yeah. And <laughs> Pretty much. Bowie you know? knife hunting. Cr and not, nothing that exciting. It was more like cricket, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, I, I, I stand by my... <laughs> Uh, you know, stereotypes of Australians, you know, it's like a Friday right. night is going out and yeah. wrestling kangaroos Wrest or something. <laughs> exactly. It's a, um, and, um, yeah. So then creative assembly went, well, they didn't want to keep doing sports stuff and they wanted to get into something interesting. And they came up with this idea of Shogun total war. And then they asked me, Jeff, could you do authentic Japanese music? And, I, and of course I said, well, of course, easy. Meanwhile, of course, I have no idea what this stuff sounds like. Every story, I, you know what I mean. It's every person classic. I've ever talked to, that yeah, <laughs> exactly. It is classic. It is the yeah. narrative of, you know, believe in yourself to either figure it out on the job or know yeah. that the moment you hang up the phone, you can find someone to call to say, "I need your help with this." I always yeah. tell if I'm talking to students and things, especially, I always say, you know, especially if you're at that phase in your career where you just need anything to stand on professionally mm. from a credits standpoint or a reputation standpoint or even just a pragmatic experience standpoint where you just need to have logged some hours doing this thing to get better at it yep always just say yes whether you yeah. can do it or not because the yeah. chances are you will be able to learn and no one really knows i mean it's i'm sure you would exactly. relate to the sentiment that you know now 
that, you know, I've been doing this not quite as long as you, but, but, um, my, I, like my first title around the, just shortly after you hooked up with these guys is when mm. I first got in. So I think mm -hmm. 2005 or six was when I first began. So it was about 15, 16 years. Mm. And what I have found is that over the span of that, um, th every year that goes by, I find my, my sort of steadfire, I know what I'm doing, seems to go down because I learn so much more than I ever previously knew that it's like there's just so much to learn. Yes. You're, you kind of, your, your, your ego gets smaller and smaller and smaller <laughs> over time, which I think is healthy. I think it's supposed I, to be how it goes. I, like, it feels right. Uh, yeah. But it, the result is that, you know, say, oh, yeah, I know what I'm doing. And then I sit down and write and I go, I'm, I'm so much more aware of the the number of possibilities. It's, it's exponentially beyond what I would have considered the possibilities of how to approach this 10 years ago, mm. that it's sort of almost more intimidating. Mm. Um, mm. But in any case, yes. Yeah. So yes, you were like, yes, I can write Japanese music. Yep. And, and of course, then I immediately started learning how that started working and I gave it a go and it was using all the typical Japanese instruments. Uh, and then, um, obviously were now we're, we're kind of skipping past the technological evolution in the industry in, yes. in the interim from the days of FM synthesis, that's right. For a Genesis game to now you're actually recording instruments and actually having sessions and things like that. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so all, all the music was streamed now, you know, so now it's like, okay, actually we've got to be able to mix things in the studio and make them sound good. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was quite happy about that because, you know, at the time, the, you know, at the time, you know, having the, having the FM synth and the square wave generator and the noise generator as your only thing was very limiting. And, yeah. you know, we made the most of it. We look back at it now and we call it chip tunes and it's charming. And I've actually had to do some recently. Um, and yeah, it was fun to, to dabble around in that again. But yeah, back then, it was like, yeah, let's let's stream stuff. Let's hire musicians. Let's like let's you know increase the exciting? quality. That you know, tail into the '90s, arriving into the early 2000s, yep. when there was a real sudden shift hmm. uh, towards recording instruments and even recording orchestras. And yep. I, I'll never forget. I was really big into the Sierra and Lucas Arts Point and Click Adventures as mm -hmm. a player, just growing up. Mm. Um, late 80s, early 90s, you know, Monkey Island, all that kind of thing. And yeah. I was a big fan, fanboy. I was like obsessed with that, that, that lineage of LucasArts games, with, yep. uh, which culminated really in Grim Fandango. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Peter McConnell, for that score, went and found these really distinctive solo musicians mm -hmm. so that it wasn't, because it's, you know, it's this hybridization of like 40s film noir with Mexican Day of the Dead. Yeah. So, you know, it had this like scorching, gorgeous mariachi trumpet next to the greasiest sax solo. <laughs> and there were such distinctive performances. It was mm. one of those you just hadn't heard video game music like that. Because, that's right. Because chip tunes, mm. um, that's just one of the limitations of that. Yes. And, and, you know, it's a very powerful type of expression you know i don't use the term chip tune in any kind of derogatory way no but it is a different thing if you need a yeah. if you need a saxophone player who can just grease their way through a solo that's just fundamentally outside the tools mm. so to me it was always an exciting time you know as a music lover mm. hearing games start to include things that other music form whether it's records or film and yep. TV music, that kind of thing that already had laid claim to for the better part of the yeah. century at that yeah. point. That's right. So it was exciting. So. It was, the thing that was really interesting too was like, there's certain things we kind of lost in the, in the interactivity uh, because with MIDI and synthesis and stuff, you can just increase the tempo of the song and it plays faster. Yeah. You can tell this thing to transpose up an octave or down or whatever, or just up a, a tone, you know, and that can influence the vibe of the music to the game right as and now uh when you when we switched to linear music that was it was more limited now because we're just we can't really change the track because we're just streaming a single track and while certain things improved in quality uh while certain things improved in quality we did lose that interactivity uh until some people started going okay let's think outside of this and yep. you know uh, you know, layers and samples and, and breaking things down and, and, and forcing that, that linear 
thing back to being more interactive, which was a, also a very interesting sort of uh, transition uh, around then, which has really gone nuts over the last, I would say, five or ten years for sure, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's where I'm just lucky I got yeah. in when I did because that's like my big passion is, yeah. you know, music design and interactive systems built on, you know, also nicely recorded, yes. great sounding stuff. That's yes. always been my kind of white whale. of How do I, how do I take what is a fundamentally linear art form, which yeah. is recording music and letting performers sort of tell a story, which requires A to B to C, you mm. need that passage of time. Well, that's linear. Yep. How do you pull the thread of that passage of time or even more consequentially, how do you make a player able to pull that thread in whichever way they're going to do it? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I feel like we still haven't written that perfect video game score that sort of somehow is just deeply, deeply interactive, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. not in a gimmicky step sequencer kind of way, which tends to be where that goes. Yes. You know, it's yep. like, it's just kind of this Steve Reich <laughs> endless sort of things yeah. that can overlap and interchange and which like you, yeah. of course yeah. if you write music like that it's sort of cheating yeah uh, how can we how could you do you know a beethoven symphony that that yeah. unfolds you know like a choose yeah. your own adventure or something yeah yeah, right? yeah. it's so, interesting it's a that would be a massive challenge but you know i think there's gonna be people doing that you know yeah you well know, it's certainly and, it's certainly a passion of mine i always yeah. try to each project try to figure out a way to Another incorporate that. that. Yeah, um, that's cool. And so, but all that said, I, one thing I'm curious about just in the minutia is, uh, where, were you able to find musicians to record these instruments in Australia? Uh, yeah, like, interestingly not enough. Not that far from Japan relative no, to well, Vancouver. This is, so. th this is it. And um, uh, yeah, there's quite a few Japanese people in Australia. Where, and I found what part of Australia were you At the time, I was living uh, at the Gold Coast, which is close to Brisbane. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, uh, for Shogun, I uh, found, uh, what did I do? I think I, what I did is I actually went to the Japanese cultural center that was there and met some Japanese people. And I said, is, does anybody here play any Japanese instruments? And they said, oh, here's, there's a Kodo player here. And <laughs> talked to her and then you know, we met up. And um, unfortunately, she wasn't really, a, 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 she didn't play very well. But she had a beautiful koto, and I ended up um, sampling her and doing some riffs and then just one-offs, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and then that's more or less what I used for for that. And then I, I, I um, rather than making it so that I could play every single note on the keyboard, uh, because a koto is kind of limited in in in, yep. in the note selection that it has, and you you so yeah, it's not you, a chromatic instrument. Yeah, exactly. So I forced my patch to have those same limitations and that helped it feel more authentic, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. And then that's still a thing. I mean, that's, is, that's exactly, you know? that's exactly what Ilana Shkeri did in even just on a compositional level for Ghost of Tsushima. It was literally, mm -hmm. okay, there's certain notes that are just off the table now. So yeah. even if I'm writing some contrapuntal orchestral piece, yeah, yeah. that's still the rule. So yes, yeah. you know, you it, were, it, you were, it helps. Yeah, it actually, absolutely. I found it kind of inspiring in a way, you know, totally. Um, um, Did you have any non-musical responsibility? Were you also doing sound design or anything like that? Or? Um, on that particular game, they hired another company to do the sound design. And then the, the sequel to it, which was uh, Medieval Total War, uh, they gave that responsibility to me, I think. Um, uh, and then um, from that point on, I would be, uh, as the games got bigger, the amount of music required got bigger and I would have less time to, time to do sound design. So I would hire other people uh, to help me with the sound design. Uh, I would always do some of it though, cause I enjoyed doing it. Yeah, sure. And, uh, and I liked how it, like, you know, the various aspects of, of doing video game audio is, is like, obviously there's the creative, the composing, uh, there's the sound design. Uh, and then there's implementation, the real technical side and where you're messing around with, well, today we use Y's and F mod and right. what have you. And I love that too. So I, I kind of just love digging in around in all these things. That's why I began by saying you're one of those you know? frustrating people <laughs> who, can, who can handle themselves in all these different departments. I, I guess so, yeah. I mean, uh, and I, it's just because I, I, I love that sort of stuff. And um, no, I think I it's fantastic. It, it, um, Shogun was like in the year 2000 and we did the sequel to it 10 years later in 2010, I think. And, um, 
whereas the original Shogun was MIDI and samplers and stuff and little little moments of live audio, um, I recorded uh, all live players on Shogun 2. And I, in Australia, um, I found a Japanese uh, drum group called Thai Cause and uh, recorded them in Sydney. Uh, and they were they were amazing musicians who uh, w worked in the local symphony um, as in the percussion department uh, in Sydney. And uh, but then their passion was Japanese music and they would go to Japan and do these big drumming uh, the tours. Tradition is unbelievable. Yeah, it is. It is. And uh, and then these guys also uh, held, uh, you know, um, uh, come learn ta uh, taiko drumming for an afternoon kind of thing. And I, I signed up for it <laughs> to just meet them. That was how I actually met them is I signed up <laughs> on into their thing, uh, stealthy wise. Yeah, that's so and, funny. And then they were teaching me how to do the drumming with about, you know, 15 other people. And we're all sitting there banging away and having to like break your back, leaning back while you're playing and really weird, awkward positions and big hand movements, which is um, counterintuitive. Um, it's very yeah. theatrical. Oh, it uh, is. It's very theatrical. But I really enjoyed it. And uh, and then after I waited till everybody was gone and it was just me and, and they were just packing up, I said, uh, I'd like to hire you guys for a recording session, if you wouldn't mind. And they were like, they were like looking at me, a bit like, who's this guy? <laughs> and then um, then um, uh, they looked into it and realized I was... I was, uh, weren't just random. I wasn't just some random and, uh, <laughs> yeah. And they were, they were really good. In fact, um, I, so, uh, a lot of my knowledge is self-taught. And so, uh, there was this point where I had to provide scores for the music and, um, I was using, I forget what I was using. I think I was using Cubase at the time. And, uh, I just put all the MIDI into there and it, there was some sort of score mode, score print. Right printed it and and i didn't really think through about the whole you know how horrible to, they look oh yeah and like and you know if you don't quantize things it just you get these crazy looking things and i these it, rhythms that look you know utterly it's, unplayable unplayable it's actually yeah. supposed to be just like yeah. a quarter note yeah. pulse, yeah and it yeah. actually looks like the most yeah. unbelievably syncopated horrible thing in Little, history like 64th note rests and stuff like that <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> anyways um so i showed up with these really ugly scores and we we had planned to do uh i think three two days of rehearsal before going into the studio just oh, to, wow. you know that was my plan because that's I, atypical. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of really glad I did it because I, it felt like, well, you know, if I was going to record a band in the studio, I'd go to the jam space and prepare and then go in the studio. But you know also, what I mean? but, so, but the so, thing that's interesting though is you you grew up watching those session players just sit. I mean, I granted these yeah. aren't session taiko drummers. Oh, actually, well, maybe they, they are. They they were they were. But but the thing is, is I think actually the, the actually yeah, it depends. was more about it was more about. Uh, uh, making sure that my charts were right, that my score was right. And it turns out we spent almost the entire time correcting all the scores. <laughs> so I have, I have all the, the original printouts where most of it's blacked out and they've just handwritten what it should have been. Yeah. Some far, far simpler. Yeah. 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 That's so yeah. funny. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, yeah, I learned a lot. I there, think all but... of us have had that moment <laughs> one time or another of just realizing, uh, you know, how did I overlook something seemingly so rudimentary and, yeah. and, 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 you know, thank God. I recently did a did a kind of a podcast thing where I was asking composers about a time where they they really dodged a bullet. You know, something mm -hmm. something that could have gone horribly. Like, imagine if you hadn't had those days, and it was we're on the clock in the studio. Yeah, we only have today. Yeah, the budget will be gone. Yep. and they're sitting there looking at these charts, going, oh, yeah. I, I can't make heads or tails of this. This doesn't yeah, look yeah. like any music I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, you kind of you kind of got lucky, but we Good. all. We all have that story, yes. one version or another. Uh, well, I find that reassuring, actually, <laughs> that you say that. Well, you know, Cause, cause you it's know. like if you do anything remotely interesting, you have to step into somewhere that you've not gone before. That's right. And so invariably, you're going to just make mistakes that True. immediately in hindsight, you go, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. that would have been, <laughs> I should have seen that coming. But it's just, it's novel. It's all new. So how, what, how yeah. can like, oh, that's the part that should be obvious. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So um, yeah, no, yes, I think you have full reason to feel <laughs> reassured that that is a uh, that is a very common one. Yeah. So so uh, um, one and, of these yeah. won a BAFTA, if I remember. Well, the first one did. Yeah, it was uh, it was actually uh, when we added the Mongol invasion add-on, I think, for Shogun 
the original Shogun. It's like 2001 or something like that. And that music, yeah, I won a BAFTA for for. Uh, Congrats! For it. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Twenty-one <laughs> years late to so congratulating you on that, but uh, still, good on you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was a total shock. Um, and um, that yeah, has it's to been, have been one of the very first. It was really game early. Game BAFTAs. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually was. didn't realize. Um, th- it makes me realize rather that I don't know when they started, but I always thought of it as a reasonably because that. You know, mm. no. In the U.S., it's not like the it's not like the Golden Globes have mm. a video game category or something mm. like that. But the Baftas mm. are kind of the the corollary to that, and they're yep. always unusual in that they they equally honor television. Mm. And there's not really, I mean, the Golden Globes kind of, I guess, are that for mm. us. But Oscars mm. are very much movies. Emmys are very much TV. Yeah. Grammys are very much like records. Yeah. So you know, yep. the, the Baftas have always been an outlier anyway. But still, like it's you, were, great. you were one of the first on deck it sounds yeah. like uh it was very close to it yeah i think it was only one year before uh and uh and it's amazing yeah so i got very lucky there and um you know it's been in uh forever it's always as- associated with my name and some sort of marketing material and stuff. <laughs> yeah. it's always just there you know um and um yeah no it's it's uh it's an honor would you prefer that they not they list the i already forgot the name of it the Genesis game that you were writing music that you wrote music for first uh, at EA in Vancouver. Would you uh, prefer the little parentheses after yeah. your name list that one yeah. instead of <laughs> instead of Shogun? Shogun? No, no, I, that's fine. No, it's it's fine. Um, um, I think the one you're thinking of is Skitchen. Skitchen. The, the, yes. reason, the reason why I brought up Skitchen is because a, a lot of people seem to like that one, and and that's all. So just, then maybe I'm right. Yeah, is it, <laughs> that one has uh, is all all like heavy heavy rock music though. That's so. Funny. That was that was my uh, introduction into rock music, and uh, my, my um, the designer on that game uh, was trying to get me into the mood of it, and he was playing me a bunch of like Rage Against the Machine and stuff ah, like that, right. and I was like, oh, this sounds awesome, oh, and I got right into it, so. <laughs> Skitching. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, all right, so at some point, obviously there were, the Creative Assembly relationship led mm-hmm. to one of my favorite games of all time, which is Alien Isolation. Ah, uh, yes. Um, and, but you were, uh, that one, what's the story there? That Because so, like, obviously that one, that one, Everything about that game is, is sort of unique and interesting. And yes, it, that was a tumultuous project. I've heard that. I've heard <laughs> that from everyone I've ever talked to who who worked on it. I, yep. I had an opportunity years ago to meet Alice there. Yep. Um, and and uh, you know because he just somehow I, I can't remember. Maybe I just cold called and said like I just I'm a, I just want you to know I'm a fan because mm. I think this was before it even came out. Maybe because mm. mm. I, I think what it was is the initial press release as they were winding up for release made mention that the that, that goldsmith's music had been licensed for that game yes and that blew my mind because i just yeah. thought that's so unusual and it's also i mean even how many people would really even know that like that's a length to go to that's catering to a kind of a niche because you mm-hmm. can make a great alien game where people mm-hmm. don't have any they don't even know who jerry goldsmith is mm-hmm. as it turns out he's like my all-time hero and i'm obsessed with him and uh, so that caught my, I remember reaching out and going, it sounds like you guys are playing to win on this thing. And then I played the game and it was like, yeah. holy shit, this is the best alien game anyone's ever made. Yep. Probably ever will make. It's amazing. I say that as someone who recently scored one of his own, like, yeah. <laughs> it's just so good. Yep. Um, I just loved it. And um, so, okay. So yes, walk me through, obviously you've already got this, you know, 15 year, however long, 10 plus year but, yeah. relationship with Creative Assembly. Yep. But this is a re- big departure for them. Yes. Uh, huge uh, departure. And, and. Um, and it was interesting because, um, you know, when, uh, just to run it back a little bit in the total war thing, I said there was like Shogun and then medieval. Then I did, uh, Rome total war, which mm-hmm. was a, which was quite a, a played the a, hell out of that game. Yeah. That, that was out. a, that was a big game. And, um, and so, uh, and then for whatever, and at this point now, Creative Assembly had an office in Australia, and we mm. were there. And um, were you actually on staff? On staff, okay. yeah. So I, I was a full-time uh, audio um, director, composer, person, and um, so. And I worked for them for about ten years or so. And uh, but then the Australian office was told to start working on an Olympics game. And hmm. I'm like, I don't want to go back to sports. <laughs> <laughs> Serve and, your time. You know, and so it was like, I said, I'm out of here, guys. And and then the guys in the UK said, oh, well, if you're not going to work for the Australian 
office anymore. Would you be our audio director uh, in the UK? But but you could do it from Australia. And I went okay. And uh, and that's when I did Shogun Two, uh, and that's then also when I did uh, Alien Isolation. So I was in Australia, and they were all in. You were doing the remote work you, before you, it was hip and yeah, cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was, and I've been still doing it, you know. And um, but I was being an audio director over Skype right. with a really awesome audio team in the UK, and basically every like six months I would go over and spend a month over there. When did it start? When did it, when did it... Well, yeah. So well, let's see. It la it launched in 2013, I think. But I mean, I think this game was actually in development for about five years. Yeah. Okay. Um, because it was it was other things before it became Alien. Right. And, it all and the time. you know what I mean. And um, and it was really interesting what they were doing. And uh, plus, they were also building their own engine. They didn't use like Unreal or something like that. They actually built the engine from the ground up, which was hugely challenging because yeah, they course. had... They There's had a reason to, why people use Unreal in e Unity. Exactly, exactly. So they were, you know, um, in some ways reinventing the wheel, but they wanted, for whatever reason, to own and make their own tech, you know. And so we had to wait a long time for the tools to be online to do it. So that was part of the reason why it was a bumpy road. Sure. Um, um, and then my distant, my distance, physical distance from them was making it difficult. I, mm. you know, I had to be like kind of become nocturnal to, yeah, yeah. to be in sync with them a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the most aggressively <laughs> disparate time zones yeah. that's possible. Oh yeah, exactly. I mean, we, opposite ends of the world. <laughs> during the, during the kind of midpoint, uh, the pandemic, um, a year ago, give or take, I do a podcast, I do it separate from this show, mm. um, uh, I do a, a show with four friends, one of whom's from Australia, she's actually from Brisbane. Mm -hmm. And um, um, she went to be with her family, like to kind of hunker down with her family during a stretch of the pandemic because she could mm. remote work. So she was there. Mm. And um, and then I was in Los Angeles. And then our one of our other folks is in the UK, lives oh, in yeah. Manchester. Yep. And so finding a time that could work basically mm -hmm. meant that, you know, it had to be fairly late for him yep. and she would watch the sunrise yeah. during our show consistently. Yeah, yeah. Like, especially yeah. when she first arrived and she had to do this two week quarantine because of COVID. Yeah, yep. Australia was obviously very aggressive about that. Yep. And so she was in this high rise uh, hotel mm. and, and literally during the course of the podcast, it'd be pitch black. You could barely yeah. see her yeah. to the point of now, now it's just like, it's all yeah. blown out from the white <laughs> balance because it's just in this direct sunlight because we yeah. record for an hour or whatever. And, yeah. and I remember thinking, you know, it, it just made me appreciate the awkwardness of the time zone difference. And so hearing you talk through it, I, I think that would be, yeah. How could it you was, not just become a vampire? Basically? Yeah. And I did. And, and also I had a young family at this point too, All you right. know? And so, uh, um, and I went over, uh, I actually seriously considered moving to the UK and, uh, and then I kind of decided, no, that I didn't want to do that to my family, uh, because Australia is a beautiful place and they were, really happy. Uh, sure, yeah. they were. So I, I, I just didn't want to do that. So uh, there was a point where I was working on, uh, I was actually writing the music for Alien Isolation as part of, you know, because that was part of the deal. So I was going to write it. And I uh, said, you know what, guys, I, I'm not going to be able to finish this game because uh, I can't keep working like this. And, and uh, so they, I left the project uh, early on. And they hired uh, another person to take over for me, um, and then they there was issues with that. And uh, like six months later, they asked me to come back for a bit, <laughs> and I helped out. And and also at this point, I they had found another uh, set of composers. Uh, at this point to take the flight, away. the flight. That's exactly right. Uh, and they did a spectacular job. Oh yeah. They did a spectacular job and they recorded at, uh, air studios, I think. And it just sounded amazing. So look, I mean, in the end, that was probably the right call, you know, uh, my version of the, what that music was going to be, was going to be a lot more analog for lack of a better word. They uh, seem to be know. in uh, in, in no disparagement meant, mm. um, kind of goldsmith homage territory. It, oh yeah. It, it was very, 
Well, they had the we had licensed the themes, right? But even and, outside of when the theme appears, yeah. just the aesthetic of the score as a, as that kind of very textural orchestral. Oh yeah, for sure. Approach, and they also uh, like apparently some of the players that played uh, in those sessions were at the original Goldsmith <laughs> sessions, which is Fantastic. just a. Uh, um, and also, just a side note: uh, Do you know the story about the soundtrack in Alien? Um, in terms of the massive hatchet job Ridley Scott subjected it to. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know that a bunch of the music that's in in the theatrical release is actually from a different movie. Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah, Jerry, uh, hated called, Jerry literally said he'd never work with Ridley Scott. Oh again yeah, on he hated hated him. Um, the there was another movie called Freud. Yep. And a Gary's lot of first Oscar nominated. Yeah, score. yeah. We're, well, you're in my you're yeah, in my wheelhouse yeah. now, man. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'll, I'll talk Goldsmith with you all oh, day. Yeah. Well, I'm a huge <laughs> fan as well, and. Um, so you know all about this, and it's a fascinating story. I don't know if we'll go into it in depths here, but but um, if you know if people are listening, that's a that's a, a very interesting story. The way that that all transpired. It's very funny you where know. you know in composer circles, mm. the story often gets circulated as this kind of like Jerry got jerked around and was very unappreciative of mm. how he was treated by Ridley and the editor in particular, who, whose name I'm, I'm forgetting. I want to say Terry. Yeah, Terry Rollins. Something like that, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Who, who were very cavalier and, oh, let's just take half of this cue, or you know this giant finale sequence that you wrote the music for? Yeah, ah, yeah. Let's just not use the music there. And, and yeah. just really um, treating it as though he, he wouldn't have any emotional investment in any of that. And, mm. and, um, and uh, and then you can watch, there's like a behind the scenes and they talk about it and you can see interviews with them and, and you yeah. see Terry Rollins kind of go, yeah, you know, we were, we were working on the movie and Mr. Goldsmith didn't, he wasn't fond of the choices that we were making. So it has such a kind of yeah. euphemistic spin on it. And it's like, you know, J Jerry literally swore he'd never work with Ridley on yeah, this. And he yeah. got begged to come back for legend. Mm. And of course it all happened again. Yeah, so yeah, then they yeah. definitely <laughs> didn't yeah. work together again. And yeah, yeah, it's, 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 um, but yeah, I remember there was that whole story of they had tempted the movie with Freud and things like that. Yes. Thinking it would, that Jerry would like that thinking, yeah. Oh, it's cool. It's thank you for not putting, John Williams in the temp or something yeah. and letting it kind of, but Jerry actually was disturbed by that because he, he thought, you know, you make this harder for me because you, it's music I already kind of solved a problem with mm. and now I have to come up with a new solution that's not that music. And it's, yeah. it, it would be a lot easier if I had a starting position that was something else. Yeah, yes. You know what I mean? Yes. And, yeah. I, I feel for the guy because that would have been, I kind of, I'm, I'm pretty sure you and I would both hate to be put in that situation you know what i mean where you've oh, written, yeah. written you know put your heart into some one movie and did something amazing and then you know and then write stuff for this new movie and they went well actually that didn't really work for us we we've gone with this other stuff you've done previously you know and, what i mean and, and, and not just previously i mean you know. freud is like 1964 mm. or something like that i mean mm. it was 15 years earlier. I mean, mm. you're a different person uh, That's from right. that kind of span. So it's kind of like, right. don't you want something that reflects where I've grown to yeah. and who I am? And, yeah. you know, what, cause Jerry was always such a producer as a composer as For well. Sure. And Alien is such an amazing testament, all the elaborate recording of the Echoplex yeah. and all that kind of stuff. That's and right. Really, really yeah. detailed work. And, it was. and uh, it was. you know, that would have been different on Freud. Just the, to the toys at yeah. your disposal would have been yeah. very different in the sixties versus 79. Yeah. I always um, love the fact as a tangent that that like the two seminal sci-fi films of 1979, Jerry did both of. Because mm -hmm. on the other hand, is also Star Trek, the motion picture, yeah. which is like mm. as opposite of Alien as anything mm. you could name in mm. a musical vocabulary that, sense. That's a fantastic theme too. You oh know? yeah, yeah. It's yeah. sort of his. It's sort of his one flag yeah. in the in the mm. lunar surface that is pop culture. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm. like that's his that's his claim to fame. He's always mm. someone who's criminally under appreciated and under under exposed mm. to the average person like they've never heard of it. if you go ask mm. a random even a film buff mm. they may not know who he is where they'll whereas they'll know Hans Zimmer they'll know John Williams they'll sure. know Danny Elfman yep but I was always to me Jerry was just always the king I mean literally I have a painting of him in the wall in my yeah, studio I don't blame him. you he's uh you know because I mean he did uh he did so many uh quintessential themes to all these amazing tv shows back then oh, you yeah. know and he just and they were all different from each other and all had such personality you know it's just 
fascinating how how consistent he was, you know. Yeah, and um, just the fact that he could so on demand reinvent himself. It, it, you know, it's like every score was written as though he had no prior experience that would lead him to kind of develop patterns like, oh, yeah, you know, this mm. is kind of like a, this is a very typical of me hook mm. or riff or rhythm or whatever. Mm. It's like he yes, he has lots of little signatures, but sure. at the same time, everyone was just so fresh that it was like a different person each time. It's just. Mm. Yep. So, so was it your whose idea was it to actually go to the trouble of licensing? Oh, I think that was Alistair. I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay, so that uh, the, wasn't. That's, yeah, because yeah. it feels like a thing a composer would have advocated for. Oh, like, I see what you mean. Yeah, no, like, they, I was looking if that was your idea. You no, know, I, I would. No, I would like to take credit for that, but no, I'm. I'm pretty sure Alistair, because I mean, we wanted, uh, we we needed full license to show everything from the movie and and, sure. and have it inspire the movie. Interestingly enough. Um, uh, we, we, we took, when we were working on early prototype versions of the game, we took music from the soundtrack, um, the final soundtrack, I suppose, uh, and put it into the game and had it playing in the background while we're running around in the game and stuff. And it, 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 we were, we thought, yeah, this is going to feel awesome. And it actually didn't, didn't quite feel awesome. Hmm. Uh, mostly because there was a massive mismatch in the production quality uh, to where, from where we are <laughs> now to the fact that, uh, all that original stuff is in mono. Right. Right. And, Interesting. and, you know, decidedly lo-fi, right. you know, and, and whereas the alien isolation is this interesting hybrid of sort of hi-fi lo-fi you know oh yeah i love and things like the film grain and the that's right the and that's frame rate and yes except that the actually the resolution of the game is really high and the frame rate's really high and there's amazing lighting i thought it effect. was 24 frames yeah. i thought they actually I thought oh it was, actually i don't know if they they maybe they did but like as an intentional cinematic thing yeah i could I, be remembering that wrong but i definitely remember the film grain for sure yeah, oh for sure that's and like definitely that fox there. logo when it first yeah, came yeah. i was like oh yeah this is so yeah. a game made by people that know what they're doing yes and that would, and you know, like it, it, Alistair's um, sort of catchphrase was uh, CRT, not LCD, you know, <laughs> and that was it. And he just kept basically saying that or versions of that to everybody. And he really synchronized the team on the, on the aesthetic, both visually and aud audibly. And, and he was uh, a joy to work with on that. Um, it sounds like you kind of, it's a very interesting and unique story that I can't really think of any other person that would have a kind of analogous example where you did what is a very difficult thing for a composer and an artist to do and to say, you know, I, I think I need to step back from this. That's a gut punch, yeah. even if it's the right choice. And mm. it sounds like it clearly was, it was, you know, taking care of your family and not relocating them halfway across mm. the world or deciding to just live like a vampire all the mm. time. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of composers, especially in your case, you know, I think something that, correct me if I'm wrong, would have exaggerated the difficulty of that decision too, is that would have entailed also quitting a, your job. It, like you were not freelance and turning down one among several freelance contracts, but you were actually severing employment yes. in the process. So yeah. it, it wasn't just even the creative roadblock that's being caused by just being a world apart and blah, yep. blah, blah. But, but it's like literally, okay, I'm going to kind of reboot the construction of my life. Yes. I, it's, it's big credit to you for having the courage to, <laughs> to do that. And probably, you know, to me, it's, I don't know it, it, if it had been 15 or 20 years earlier and you were younger and more hot headed, I suspect you may have figured out a way or, or like mm. aspired to figure out a way to muscle through it. But there's always something that I find is inspiring as, as I get older and as, mm. as I just, my role models evolve, uh, someone who's kind of looking and taking stock and make an honest assessment and just makes the difficult call and doesn't mm. have this self-destructive mm -hmm. choice out of a otherwise admirable aspiration to, mm. I want to do it all and conquer the world, you know? Mm. And so anyway, it's, it's, I'm it, not really so much asking a question as, as, yeah, well, I as appreciate acknowledging it. I, that it you. couldn't have been easy. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, easy. Uh, it was consistent with what I did in 97 when I left EA because that was... But how exponentially easier that would have been then Well, by because of youthful uh, optimism, right? right. And, and, uh, uh, and, and, but I thought, well, if I've done this before and I survived, I, I think I can do this, you know, and I have a reputation now. Um, and, um, just, just to finish off what ended up happening with that is that, uh, uh, in the end, they brought me back for the last sort of two months of the project 
and we finished off the final mix of the game and the person that they had hired to replace me uh, left and they they needed me to come back and, and in, help them finish it. So in like an uh, audio director capacity. Yes. Like yeah. Yeah. Oversee just yeah, the finalizing. Exactly. Everything. And so I and I was and it felt great to be in the end uh, there at the beginning, a little bit in the middle and then and also right at the end. Um, and, and, I you know, got my hands dirty and wise helping with, uh, setting things up and, and with the final mix and stuff. And, uh, but the guys, I had such a great team on that project. Uh, well, at least I guess I call them my team, but they were all employees of creative assembly, but they were all amazing and, uh, and deserve, uh, the BAFTA that, that, that one, you know, cause, uh, that was, uh, uh, an amazing effort, but, um, uh, also, as you said, I did. Yes, I did. In fact, quit my. Was job. that an audio? Was that the? There's two. There's always like yeah, music this, and audio. As I, this was an audio for for. I do best still audio. remember. Yeah. Uh, it went. I mean, because I remember yeah. thinking, no duh. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like not even knowing what it took to get mm -hmm. to the finish line and how difficult yeah. and everything, yeah. but just the final product. Yeah, was, every aspect of that game to me was essentially flawless. It's it's. Uh, I didn't yeah. even agree with the people that felt it kind of dragged by the end, and, and sure, that was a consistent <laughs> feedback I came across. And sure. I thought, to me, it breezed by. It was like yeah. twenty one hours or whatever of, of yeah. like that. I yeah. mean, it just it was it was. That's cool. The other thing that that game did, just as a forgive my nerding here for a second, but the, that mm. game did what very few games have ever managed to achieve, which is it it introduces an enemy fairly early on mm -hmm. that is like impossibly difficult you basically have to avoid it yep and it manages to make that a consistently interesting through line for the entire game mm. you never get your your you know duke nukem bfg and and then just yeah. mow down the yeah, xenomorphs yeah. and it's like they become a non-issue yeah, yeah. every time they are extremely threatening and instantly fatal to the player and yeah. and not and you don't at least for me, I mm. never fell out of love on account of that. I never mm. thought, okay, now it's just annoying. Now yeah. it's like an impediment. It was mm. like, no, this is scary and it's interesting. And I remember playing with yeah. my my ex at the time. We would play on. I'd, I'd sit sit her on the couch next to me while I'd play, mm -hmm. and we'd turn off all the lights. And and for her, she was effectively watching an alien movie, and it yeah. scared the bejesus out of her. <laughs> and it was so effective, and that made me enjoy it ten times more because yeah, I'm like yeah. vicariously <laughs> off, living off of her her sort of electricity. And, yeah. Um, God, yeah. I just, yeah, I just loved it. It was so nailed. Yeah. So really I love able. hearing that there's kind of yeah. a happy ending yeah, with your end relationship with creative assembly yeah. and all that. It, yeah. You know. In the end. Yeah. It was, it was, I'm glad that that's how it ended up ending off. And, uh, and interestingly, that was when I sort of went indie and, and I haven't looked back since. And freelance. Actually. Freelance. I mean, you've started since your own outfit, right? Is that what I'm, I understand? Yeah, I'm involved in a few outfits is what I've done. Okay, uh, got it. Which is interesting. Um, so I'm involved with uh, a few developers, uh, Witchbeam, uh, who did uh, Assault Android Cactus, which was the next game that we did uh, after, or I did that uh, after Alien Isolation. And, um, and then we, we've also gone on to do Unpacking. Um, and I'm we'll get involved. to that in a second. Yeah, we'll get to that in a bit. And then the uh, the other company is called uh, Earthwork Games, and we do a little game called Forts, which has done quite well. It's just this little game that, uh, for some reason, not a lot of people have heard of, but it's seemingly ticking along. And people are still buying it five years later. You know, and they love those. You know, and in fact, the last DLC we just did uh, called high seas um i didn't have time to do the music on it so my daughter wrote the soundtrack oh no it, kidding which is really cool oh so, that's amazing so uh the next generation is coming up uh, yeah. you know and um and so you're obviously not good at the sort of <laughs> jealous parent thing worried about being uh supplanted and, oh, and no, keeping no, no. your child down that's no, a classic it's, trope power to her uh, power to her you know let it go go nuts you know and uh and then uh, look after me when I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yes, this is a retirement investment. <laughs> yeah. That's too funny. Uh, well, um, yeah. so yeah, you were you had a, a little bit of a, a viral moment uh, mm. with unpacking. Mm. I I have not had a chance to play unpacking yet. Okay, um, but about a thousand people came to me all at once on Twitter <laughs> because this game was selling itself from its sound design, which I don't mm. think I've ever really seen before. But it's just the the novelty i think i saw kevin regami if you know him i know kevin um share a tweet mm -hmm. uh that, that caught my eye of of uh, you know this 
the the elaborateness of this game for, mm. is first off probably essential because that that that's all there is to the game. That's exactly. So you know it was like, well, what else are, what else could it be if not mm. that? Because mm. it's not like there's a multiplayer mode or something that is where we're going to put all our energy or like the death mm. match mode something like that. It's like this one thing has to be. I remember this came up with Steve Johnson, the sound designer, mm. when we were working on Journey, where you know the amount of effort that went into thinking about the foley of the footsteps in the sand. And it was like, mm. this is the number one thing the player is going to hear mm -hmm. from start to finish through this game. It better be somehow perfectly kind of innocuous that it's not in your face all the time. But also, I remember Genova, the creative director, was very keen on it feeling very satisfying. He's like, I want to actually, I, I want to want to walk in the sand from yeah. the sound yeah, feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's one of those wonderful kind of dark arts of of games and film and tv and people they see the transformers mm -hmm. you know and the ben burt type work in the world and yep. and it's very flashy and sexy and obviously incredible mm. but the nuance of things like i always remember the first time i remember playing a game i i don't know what game it would have been but somewhere kind of in the 90s we reached a point where if in a first person game i'm running across a carpeted floor and i cross over onto like a marble floor my mm. footsteps change yep and i, and I remember as a person who was just kind of attenuated to audio, mm. that caught me. I mm. thought, ooh, mm. they've, the system knew. Yep. Uh, and yeah. ever since then, you know, those things have just gotten more and more, more and more yeah. elaborate. But this game was on a whole other level. I mean, mm. the, the specific tweet was like 15,000 or mm. 14,000 discrete assets or something mm. like that. So yep. first off, I just want to hear general thoughts about it. But the thing that I want to not forget to, to ask you, Mm. is when earlier you were saying the interactivity that real-time chip synthesis mm -hmm. offers mm -hmm. is so vast compared to recorded audio. Yep. And therefore, typically, as of now, uh, the only real way to create something elaborately uh, uh, interactive is this kind of brute force, we just need a lot of content. Mm -hmm. In the same way that the writer, if you want a big elaborate branching RPG or something, you just have to write like 80,000 lines of dialogue. There's just no way around yeah. creating crazy amounts of content. Mm. Um, and so th that struck me as one of those cases where I said, yeah, if you want a game that's just so nuanced and so variable and so player has so much agency on even just these little fine grain details. Mm. The way you do it is a thing where you end up with 14,000. So I, yeah. I want to hear about it in general, mm. you, how you mm. got involved and kind of where, yep. you, you know, the headspace. And you also wrote the score. I listened yeah. to, I listened to, I didn't get a chance to hear the entire thing, but mm -hmm. I listened to it. It was very nice. And I yeah. suspect that's what you were referring to when you said you got to go back to that. Yeah, so, yeah. that was it. Yeah. It was, it, it's really nice. Thank you. Um, and really well produced. I mean, really yeah. loved the way the sound, those kind of choked, chords and the yeah. guitar yeah. there's i always struggle to record that in a way that sounds as good as how you did it yeah. and um, you know what's interesting about that is that i used a, a vst for that stuff and when i was writing and then i brought in my guitar player friend and i couldn't get i couldn't get the, the same problem I, I had the same problem i couldn't get what he was doing we tried different mics different guitars and i was and i just went you know what i'm gonna there's something charming about the VST version. So that's sample. Those are samples. That's so funny. You know, you that, know same, I mean? <laughs> that same thing happened. It's actually weirdly comforting to, yeah. to learn that, that, you know, somebody who probably knows a lot more about the hardware than I do uh, and, and about mixing and engineering would have the same yeah. struggle. Yeah. I've always, sometimes you hear a recording and the guitar sounds like an orchestra. It's yeah. just so lush and amazing. Yes. And, uh, you know, I've just, that's one of those... It's one of those things I haven't quite mm. somehow conquered. And it, it, so this was uh, yeah. Golden, Elliot Goldenthal, you know, he won the Oscar for um, Frida, the movie mm. about Frida Kahlo mm. with Salma mm. Hayek. Mm. And I remember having the same exact question on that in 2002. And right. it's also samples oh, right. in that score Interesting. on some of them, on some yeah, of the right. rhythm, you know, kind yeah, of yeah. where they found a sample they liked and they just... Yeah. They couldn't reproduce yeah. it, so they used it. That's interesting. And um, which That's I thought was very funny. So this is apparently a timeless problem, but I think so. And and I and the way I justified it is I thought, well, you know, it's it's uh, in line with the fact that the other chip sounds are are artificial. That the the guitar, even though it sounds natural, is also still has an artificialness to it. <laughs> you know, that was the way I justified it. Whatever helps it. you sleep at night. Exactly. Um, well, so how and, did that one come to be, and where did you? 
step in? How well, early? And was so, there a conception that it was going to be that elaborate from the start? No, no, no. Uh, the key word here um, from my point of view was underestimation. Uh, <laughs> all the way th right from the get go. Uh, I looked Up at to it, it, including the response. I, uh, I hope. Yeah, it, absolutely. Including the response. Um, and uh, I saw a game where you just pick up cups and plates and stuff and pick them up and put them away. And, and I thought, okay, well, I need a pickup sound. I need a place sound. And then, and then I went, Oh, I, I see you, you can, you can place these things on different surfaces. So there we're going to have to have different sounds there. Okay. That's fine. And, uh, um, you know, we, the prototype we we're working on was a kitchen level and I've gone into my kitchen and I recorded all my things in my kitchen. Um, I'm going to go into this in great detail in my talk tomorrow, by the way. I'm um, planning on being there. And, um, and this is the warm up. Yeah, this is where you can get is, all the bugs out of the system. That's right. right. <laughs> and um, so basically, it, it, I thought I had nailed it. It was sounding nice. And then the designer said, oh, uh, we're, we're adding uh, each level is going to have different rooms. So there's going to be like kitchen, bedroom, bathroom. And there's going to be uh, eight different levels. And there's going to be like five or 600 items uh, in the game and probably about 15 surfaces. And the numbers just started multiplying yeah, in my head. head. Yeah, right? Right, yeah. And I realized also that I can't record this when I can't record all this stuff in each room because that's just going to be literally millions of sounds. Um, so uh, I thought, OK, what I'll do is I'll record it all in a dry, in a dead room. We use the spare bedroom to record it. Uh, and I'll add all the ambience or the reflections and stuff right. artificially, uh, which turned out to be the right choice uh, to just keep the number of sounds to down to a low number of fourteen thousand. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, and because it could have been way worse. And I mean, yeah, yeah. The, the, that if 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 everything had to be a one to one match of what's possible, and that was my initial intention because I wanted that detail. Because I realized quite quickly that all you do in this game is pick stuff up and put it down. There's but a bit it of it. Raises a, an interesting, um, it raises an interesting question. You know, I love sitting in on the um, kind of general audio, you know, team meetings where, you know, as someone who really only does music, mm. it's still fascinating. I, I was working on a game that's a side scroller, but the player. It's not that the player is fixed in position and the world is moving by on a treadmill. The player can move around. So it very much became this question of um, as a, when a sound effect, if the player goes up and like smashes something, um, what is the point of view for, you know, where, like, does the camera hear that? Or are we in the player, the avatar POV? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. where are we placing the sound? Mm -hmm. And it's one of those that, you know, until you think about it, you may not ever think about a question like that. And, or mm -hmm. at least in, 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 unless you're in our kind of line of work here. True. And so... The first question that that raises, like that, that is the question that unpacking then raises where I could see a thing where, okay, we're in a pretty live space right now, mm -hmm. despite all sort of felty mm. surfaces in here. It's remarkably uh, reflective. Yep. And I have a little empty paper cup. Mm -hmm. So if I, mm -hmm. you can hear a lot of reflection of that on the ground. If yep. you wanted to capture the space, you know, you set up like surrounds over in those corners or whatever, you'd get a real good sense, you know, in tandem with something close. You could really do what you were talking about that you had to abandon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but the question is, but what the the game has this perspective where you're kind of it's like the Sims, where you're sort of this omniscient presence outside of the space. You're not you're not in it. So then but Well, you're in the room with you know, obviously with the the items. Um, but it's not like a first person. No, no, no. It's a third person view, I suppose. Yeah. The, so it yeah, just yeah, raises yeah. the question then yeah. of like how much of the space beyond the surface became crucial in order to capture the perception of where the listener is. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think it was uh, – we absolutely had to have that in there. Uh, and, and because, you, you know, when you go into a kitchen, the kitchens are ambient. You know, they're echoey because of all the hard surfaces. Yep. And you go into a bedroom – the bed soaks up all the ambience, all the reflections and stuff. So mm -hmm. it, uh, it, and it, as soon as we added that different uh, difference, it just made everything feel uh, more engaging and natural, you know? So we needed to record everything dry and we needed to record everything on each surface. Uh, what, what we realized though is like, 
what we didn't need to do is like, you know, we all have a bunch of different coffee cups, right? I didn't need to record all the different coffee cups. I just needed one right. and just lots of variations of that one. Yeah. And, and when you grab the other ones, even though they're slightly different shapes, it doesn't phase you that they are triggering the same set of sounds right. because there's so many variants. Sure. You, they all sound a little bit different to each other. So we start. How many variants mm-hmm. would you typically make? I would record 10. You know, and um, and actually, when per I say object per surface, per per yeah, exactly. Um, and when I say I was recording it, um, actually, uh, my wife Angela did most of the recording. Um, <laughs> I mean, fourteen thousand—that's a lot of hours. It's so. a lot of hours. I didn't have time to do it. I had time to help design the process and the 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 system, and and then uh, and Angela and I, you know, did a lot of to and fro about how things were organized and stuff. Uh, but ultimately, once we had kind of our our workflow, she's the one that ran ran through it and did it all, which is uh, amazing. Out of curiosity, uh, <laughs> just from a purely again, it's a sort of a logistics thing. Did did you record that by having essentially a field recorder set up in your in your bedroom, or did you like wheel in a Pro Tools rig? And oh uh, yeah, well, um, initially I tried using a little DA40 field recorder, mm-hmm. and a little Tascam. Uh, turns out the inputs on it were a little bit noisy. So uh, I had a, I just had a laptop and an interface and, uh, and we, yeah. So, I mean, I suppose it was that, but it's just, you know, a, audio a, gear. A mobile that, rig, yeah. yeah. it was a mobile rig. What kind of mic did you use? For um, it was the uh, Sennheiser uh, uh, 8040, uh, just a little black, the little black thing. Uh, yeah. Sennheiser 8040. I think that's what it was. Uh, and um, beautiful sounding mic. Um the first mic I used in my kitchen was a Rode NT2A, which is like a vocal mic. Right? I've used uh, yeah. I've used one for yeah. ten years yeah. worth of beautiful mic, great mic, meat and potatoes kind of mic, right? Um, and it captured a lot of the ambience in my kitchen. It actually sounded quite nice because it was natural ambience. Uh, unfortunately, I had to bail on it because uh, that mic does tend to capture a lot of the room. Yeah. Um, whereas the the other the 8040 was uh, much more. Uh, you know, a tighter pattern. Near field, right, sure. Exactly, you know, so, um, which, and I didn't want any sound of the room we were recording in. Um, and yeah, so that's, uh, so so we, basically what I, what kept on happening is that the game's kind of scope got a little bit bigger and a bit bigger and got too big for me to handle by myself. So I got uh, Angela to help me uh, <laughs> with that. And that's how we, uh, you know, because that was her sole focus, she, Put her head down and went through the process. How of long recording. did it take? I mean, I mean tens in the of thousands. It's- in the well, this is the other part of the the talk is how we saved a lot of time using uh, Reaper and uh, some uh, good use of uh, uh, dynamic splitting and batch processing and what have you. And uh, so while she did do well, there's no doubt she did a lot of recording and a lot of editing. But there's lots of parts of the process that were automated that helped rain in Amazing. you know so but i think basically she worked on it maybe three or four months i think pretty solid you know to get through all of that stuff uh so yeah it was a it was a, a lot of work uh and then getting it all into wise uh, we used wise and and again that was another part that we automated um and um and the way we had set it up is uh, it, everything was non-destructive because I, I wasn't sure exactly what we wanted to end up with uh, audio file wise. Uh, and I wasn't sure if, you know, we're going to have space issues. I mean, if I, you know, who knew, right? So, and I wasn't sure, you know, uh, just like volume ranges and, you know, stereo or mono and all these sort, sort of things. So I just didn't want to print anything to tape, so to speak. Right. <laughs> right. And, and, uh, and uh, the way we set it up is, is it was very um, flexible basically for lack of a better word and uh so then i was able to focus on the music and on the music side uh um we decided to do uh uh, chip tunes uh meets the acoustic guitar and and then you know there's a few characters in the game and i did that thing where you assigned an instrument to a character and that just sort of helped uh give me a structure to work with uh from level to level in the game and uh the other thing is the character, we follow a character's life. We never meet this character. You never see her. You never, she doesn't say anything. There's no text from her or anything. You, you only learn about her by unpacking 
darker stuff, which right. is where this is what's captured people's yeah that uh, I, thing. That, it's just it's like uh, it's an oddly emotional game for people. Incredibly emotional. Like in and, a very, uh, it's a game that when you look at some you know like GIF of mm -hmm. it or a little snapshot on yeah. Twitter of a five second little video, yeah, it looks like. One of those we go, okay, yeah, it's another one of those indie games where somebody took like a, a kind of an almost ironically banal thing and said, yeah. what if we made a game out of that? Like, yeah. what if I made a game about doing the dishes? Or what if I made yeah. a game about, like, there's a, there's this certain, there's a certain kind of indie developer that is trying to learn what's the mm -hmm. thing. Like, you remember that movie Boyhood? Mm -hmm. You know, like, let's mm -hmm. just look at little snapshots of a kid's life over a 12 year period. There's no real plot. There's no mm. real, it's just kind of, and similarly, by the time I got to into that movie, I was like so invested and so moved by just watching normal life. Yes. And, and, yes. and there's something so beautiful about yes. just kind of seeing a human being. And of course, in that case of that movie, it was because it was literally the kid was growing up. I mean, you filmed it, mm. you filmed it over like a 12 year period. Yeah. So the actor is yeah. evolving and, and, um, and and again, I, I I I sadly have not had a chance to play unpacking it, but I keep hearing that the thing that makes me so excited to check it out was that everyone said it presents itself as if it's just this kind of kitschy thing, or yes. at least it's easy to think that it might be. And then by yeah. you know people get so invested in yeah, moved. it's a it's uh I mean it's all about uh, it's it's a really amazing use of environmental storytelling. Yep. Uh, you're like an archaeologist uncovering this story and interpreting it too. And the way you play it and your interpretation might be different to mine, which is also interesting because people yeah. then have discussion of that. Was right? how much of that was baked in from the premise when you signed on? Or did this, oh, this was it, like a discovery of what this the game was a could discovery. Be? Yeah, exactly. And I think even for the game designers, because you know, uh, Ren has said that she uh, wasn't came up with the idea when Tim uh, uh, moved in with her. Um, and, and, you know, they were putting his stuff away and, well, firstly, she finds tidying up and, and ha having things just so in a, in a, in a shelf and stuff like she, that she finds that relaxing mm. and there's, and this is a, it's a thing like people find the having things, you, kind of yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like make it, make it all just orderly and it's in a certain order and color aesthetic. Um, some people call it OCD. I don't. I don't know if it's OCD with her, but it. But it's well, definitely. There's a spectrum there. I it's think. a no. I would. I wouldn't say. It's, I. I. It's all I mean is that it's. It's. She has said to me that it's a process that she finds relaxing, and and exactly. the they they immediate like Tim went. Oh, okay. I'll I'll have a go at making that into a game, and and he's our our programmer and designer as well, and he actually started making it a, a, a reality and then they started putting in items and I think it was during that process they started to realize that there's a story behind the items Dang. and then they came up with this really neat story that people really like and I really like the story. Where and, uh, in the process did you get involved in? I was there well almost from the very start um, and uh, when they showed me a rough a uh, prototype of it working and they said could could you make some sounds for this and some some music that we could put in and we're gonna you know they ended up going to this thing called stugen in sweden in sweden i think uh which is like a workshop thing that you do for like two months and you you bring your prototype game and all all the devs and stuff like look at each other's games and just wow totally never heard of that. yeah yeah it sounds really interesting actually it does. they had a great time and then you got friends for life from yeah, doing right, that kind exactly. of thing you know and um, they did that and they came back and uh, I think what they had plans on actually finishing the game there, but actually in the end, I think they came back with just a much more focused version of what they arrived with, but a lot more clarity on what the full game design should be. And that's when they started saying, yeah, we're going to have all these different levels and these different rooms and these items. Some items are going to follow this character throughout their whole life, which says something about those items. Some items are going to go away. New things will appear. And I mean, really, the thing is, too, and this is where I think it relates to all of us, is when you're following this person's life, we all have like these, these uh, keyframes or bookmarks in our life, like when, the first place you moved out when you moved out of home, right? Uh, yep. Or if you move, and then... So for our character, she goes to, to uni and gets, goes into a dorm with, you know, scratched walls and mm -hmm. right near noisy traffic and stuff. And then, then she graduates and moves in with roommates, you know, mm -hmm. and that whole thing. And then she moves in with her first boyfriend, you know. And somehow we managed 
somehow the designers have managed to make possibly the most hated boyfriend on the internet uh, with, by, purely because of the way they, uh, you know, I'm not going to give out any spoilers, but basically uh, he annoyed everybody on the internet, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> which is amazing. Amazing. And, and purely by just unpacking stuff and putting it away. I, I so <laughs> love this about, about games as an art form um, that, you know, I see the various awards shows that, that will often have a kind of like category of best, you know, innovation in story where the idea is how can we tell a story? Games gives you the opportunity to tell a story in just about any way that you can imagine mm. someone interacting with a piece of software. Mm -hmm. So whether it's, it's um, uh, you know, telling a story by, by, triggering cutscenes and doing something that's extremely cinematic and very kind of familiar as a way to thing yeah. or something like this, which, yeah. you know, you go back not that long ago and explain a game like this to somebody, you go back mm. to the mid nineties and say, we're going to make a game that's about unpacking, you know, people mm -hmm. think you're out of your mind. Yeah. They, 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 they'd <laughs> either go, I just can't see it. Or they'd say, that sounds like maybe the dumbest idea I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, it was it, it it is it is truly amazing. Well, so one other just one last thing to ask about it sure. that comes that comes to mind that that's mm. very interesting uh thing that you somehow managed to outmaneuver. It sounds like it's really well um really well um organized um uh, just based on what you were saying in terms of the tr things you're going to be getting into with Reaper and your mm -hmm. talk. Mm. And um um I'm curious, one of the things that is a constant problem in game design is as scope increases, which often there's a good reason for it. Like mm. you realize, oh, if we just did this, we'd have an even, we'd have an exponentially better game. Mm. Like it's no longer just move things around and put them on surfaces because I find that act cathartic, but mm. we can actually tell a story. We mm. can actually get something that's really emotionally involved. And, and, and so you follow those roads. That's part of one of the things that makes games is so difficult to make is you you round a bend of, a, of an idea and you discover this is definitely what we want to make but it turns out this is way more complicated now and mm. way more sort of resource demanding and, and it's mm. going to take three times longer than the game was gonna if we hadn't mm. turned that corner mm. this is a common problem yep and there's no real fix because it part of it is just you make discoveries and then the costs associated, you have to decide if you're going to chase that or not. And if you mm -hmm. decide to, it's just going to, it's just going to balloon a bit. And I, you know, but it, but it sounds like you managed to avoid the normal pitfalls. At least it sounds like that of, mm -hmm. of, Hey, this thing is originally going to be this scope. So I'm going to, I'm going to, it's like, how much gas are you going to put in the car? Mm -hmm. If I only need to go five miles, I don't need to go buy a thousand dollars worth of gas as mm. if I was mm. trekking across in a continent. Mm. And so, and we have this problem all the time. You realize, mm. oh crap, I actually, you know, to, to finish off the analogy, it's mm. like, if you realize I don't have enough gas to get to the finish line because it turns out the destination is a lot farther rather than go and run out, I have to go back to where I started, mm. buy a different car that can have that kind of gas and go. And so many times, the delays on these games is caused when you realize to, to satisfy that scope, we essentially have to tear down what we've built mm. and build it again because it can't just scale infinitely. How did you avoid that if this thing kept well, constantly being yeah. bigger than expected? Mm. You know, mm. it's not a linear path a lot of the time. No, I, but I guess it might be one of the benefits of being indie and small is the, the costs um, can be lower. Every, most people on the team are working for future potential you know, like there's sure. quite often a lot of people in India are working for free until they release their game. Yeah, you know? I'm all too familiar. Uh, us included, you know. Actually, I think uh, Unpacking was mostly funded by the sales of our previous game, Assault Android Cactus. All right. Uh, and we got a, uh, a grant from the government uh, in Queensland. Um, they're very, um, they're very aggressive about supporting yeah, their local arts. Uh, uh, yeah, as they should be. <laughs> yeah, it's, I've seen, I've been, you know, I've been on the receiving end yeah, of that before, and it's yeah. pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, but you know, it wasn't huge amount. It wasn't millions of dollars. You know, um, and uh, no, but it can make the difference know, of a small team having runway. Exactly, exactly. It was enough to just you know keep us along. Uh, and also everybody kind of just, you know, living lean for a while, you know, <laughs> um, um, although I suppose for myself, you know, trying to be responsible dad and all that sort of stuff, uh, I, uh, ha try to have a few irons in the fire so that, 
you know, to, the nature to cover of a freelancer as well. You know how Some, it is. Something yeah. delays something exactly. Early. But 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 it, ultimately, um, as clarity um, uh, came in terms of like the design and scope, things did extend, and there was a point where I had to go to my business partners and say, "Hey, you know, uh, I want." Um, I want to uh, spend more on the Foley recording uh, because it's bigger than I realized, you know, and they all went, yep, understood, you know. So, um, and th they also at one point said, you know what, we are falling behind our sort of scheduled plan, so we hired another artist to help us, and we, we were just making the call to spend more money to so we could finish this game. And if we didn't spend more money, we'd be still working on it. <laughs> but by you the know, Saturday, so, yeah, well, yeah, believe you know. me, I, I know that, I know that dance too. <laughs> it can be very seductive, you know, it's yeah. because it's just, you realize, oh, mm. I can, what's another mm. thousand sounds at this point? You yeah. Know, like it, you're it was, so already so far in, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I mean, and you know, we did, so we made that call and it was, I think it was the right call in the end. And I'm so glad that we did put all this extra energy into the Foley and stuff because it's being so well received, you know, and people are enjoying this, the efforts that we did. Again, that, I'll just you know, reiterate, you know, I, I never saw a game go viral on account of its Foley. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and, and one of the points I make in my talk is that, uh, and I think you were alluding to this earlier is that, um, uh, First person shooters, you know, lots of stuff happening, explosions, music, dialogue. We're not going to hear, we're not going to be able to hear the real cool, uh, uh, the way the footsteps and the foley and the, the dirt, you know, going up against the shoes and what have you. And, and, and it, you're just not going to get a moment to appreciate that. Whereas in this game, there's none of that stuff going on. Yep. All there is is some birds tweeting outside and, mm -hmm. and the room tone and then my chip tunes and, and now there's all this space for you to hear how that fork sounds different on every single surface. And because people haven't, have never had that sort of quiet, chilled space to just kind of comp contemplate that. And now they're going, wow, that's actually pretty amazing, you know, and uh, that that's there. And, yep. you know, I, um, I'm here there to say is like, well, this is not new technology. I mean, games have been doing this for years, you know, it's just that... It just so happens in this particular game, there's so much space you can really notice. Well, it, and also, it, it, it is the game as mm. opposed to, you know, Foley, which represents a level of polish in another game. Yep. You know, like if it's a first person shooter and I am holding an object and I drop it, we mm. want to make sure that it drops onto and the surface that it's dropping onto reflects the sound that yeah. it's triggered. Yep. But that's the game is like solve the mystery or yeah. like find the murderer or whatever. Yeah, like yeah, 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 you're yeah, not yeah. thinking it would just ping if it was wrong. That's right. But it's not the game. It's, right. you know, it's, it's not, Oh, what if I make a game about putting things on surfaces? <laughs> um, I just think it's amazing. I just yeah. think it's so, I, I, I begrudge the fact that I haven't had a chance to play it before this chat. Cause I probably mm. would have had a thousand other questions, but I'll just have to chase you down for more. Yeah, no um, <laughs> but it's truly, it's truly, it's truly incredible. And it sounds like, you know, what I was asking about was kind of particularly along the wavelength of if there was like a pipeline that, that would have had a big disruption about expanding in scope. But it sounds like it really just came down to, we just need the literal hours in the day to get through the, the sort of asset list mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of brute force, you yeah. know, and, and, uh, um, but they, it needed that and there was space for it. And I, I kind of had a hunch that people were going to like this, that they, because it was so exposed you know, and so, so noticeable that even people who aren't audio people will notice it. And that's, and that's what's happened here is that people are, have noticed this, you know, and we have other things in there, you know, you can pick up something and shake it and it rattles, you know, <laughs> it's such a simple thing that, you know, but, and in the technology behind that is no different than if I was making a sample library of, of a shaker or a tambourine, right. we use the exact same logic and same technology, except we used wise to do it. The detected the speed of the mouse and Zoom mod wheel, and basically. exactly or velocity, you know what <laughs> I mean, and and so you can kind of jammer along to the music by sh when shaking something. That's right? so funny, you know. Uh, there's just all those little things, and then you know we hid a lot of audio within some of the items. Like if you pl hit play on the on a cassette deck, it plays a song that matches what the character would be into at that time. Mm. You know, so. 
Um, early on, you can kind of tell that maybe this is in 1997. The kid was maybe, I don't know, eight years old uh, and they're into aqua, you know. <laughs> so, so there's I had to write some songs that were in line with different pop music at different eras and stuff. How uh, does that and, work from a mixing standpoint if you have a non-diegetic score cranking along and oh, the yeah. player can theoretically do you just – collide them do you, do you I, I tried of... that I, I i tried that i didn't like it so basically the 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 sort of uh background music as to say uh gets muted when you hit play on the tape recorder and now sort of and now handoff. the sound is is 3d and wherever you move it you 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 feel it pan and stuff and if you turn the speaker away it gets a bit muffled and you know it's all that sort of stuff if you go into another room you can still hear it in the mm. other room a bit quiet and muffled and stuff and then when it stops the the background music just comes back on with just a quick fade so it's a simple solution but you know and it it works you know well and it's you also know. you know it, it also doesn't obscure to the player what they're doing that's yeah. always the challenge with a thing like that yeah. is you can come up with something super clever and but the yeah. legibility of of what you've just done to the player might be uh hidden and they therefore mm. they don't really appreciate yeah like oh how cool that you kind of blended the two and all they yeah. know is it's like kind of messy or something yeah actually it was a funny thing is there was a uh, a streamer on youtube um who was in one of the levels and um uh this is a level where the the main character is feeling pretty good about themselves sorry they're feeling pretty good because they've kind of they're moved into their own place and 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 feeling like their their career is starting to go and and uh, so I, I I wrote this sort of uh, kind of punk rock song that's kind of got a lot of energy um, and um, and the streamer was played it and she's like nodding along while she's playing and then she goes into another room and the music is playing quieter now because she's moved so she's gone oh and she went back and grabbed the speaker. And moved it into the room. And she and now she's working here. And then she moved to another room, and she had to keep taking the speaker with her to listen to the music in the That's in the awesome. room, which is like a, a form of gameplay or something. Yeah, but right. that I that I didn't really prepare for or, or think was going to happen. But I did That's like the right. fact that the music was playing in this thing that you could move around, and uh, it was really fun to watch them discover that. Then then also they just happened to really like that song, and uh, which is called. Um, yeah, nah, and uh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love those kinds of moments. It's sort of emergent play. They, they, yeah. they, they, they do something with it that it wasn't necessarily designed for, but it's completely compatible with. Yes. Again, that's one of those things that's so unique to games. Yes. It's not like I can discover something really cool by watching a movie at a different playback speed or something, you know, yeah. typically or whatever. Yeah. It's just not even really even, even a crude equivalent. And yeah. I just, I never get tired of those stories. Mm. Yeah. Um, Yep. Well, I can't thank you enough. This this is uh, just loaded with with, um, <laughs> with great stuff, and you know, of course, your GDC talk will uh, it, like people will hear it before they have a chance to hear this. This oh, will right. be however many weeks or whatever from mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully, that talk, hopefully your GDC talk, is one of those that ends up on YouTube, and the whole world can yeah, I, can I think follow it will. up on their interests. Yeah, uh, I think they, I think they release them like after a year or something like that. Or I don't know how exactly it works, but uh, it seems like yeah. yeah, lately they've been finding their way onto, and yeah, so hopefully yeah. people. Um, and um, but it was an absolute pleasure to talk to you and uh, get to know you a little bit. Yeah, no, yeah, like it, it's it's rare to it's rare to have the chance to meet somebody for the first time mm. uh, with this, and and yet and yet be also very familiar with their work, you know. Because mm. never mind isolation, I was also mm. a big player of especially mm. Rome, uh, mm. but um, but even Shogun back mm. in the day. Mm. Um, so it, yeah, it's a real pleasure, and I absolutely also just love. Um, uh, the the career arc of uh, you know games like that and you know a really high profile title like Isolation, um, and then a game that couldn't be more quintessentially indie mm. as Unpacking. I mean, it's just <laughs> I can't be hard pressed to name a game that couldn't have been made any other way than mm. the way the indie world works. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. it's just what big AAA publisher would green light a game like that. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just it's so. And that's not a disparagement yeah. of the AAA world. It's just like I love that we live in a world that has these parallel lanes that 
if you want to go make a horizon, you know, that's really, really ambitious on a, on a, on every level, yeah. there's a lot of to do, or like, you know, insomniacs like Spider-Man and Miles Morales or God mm. of War or something, you know, there's just a halo. Mm. There's so many titles that could never be made independently. Um, yeah. and then, and then somebody, yeah. Who's like, you know, I, I wonder if I made a game out of my experience that I just personally find cathartic of placing things on shelves and yeah. making it look nice. And I just, I love being in this moment in the yeah, industry. It's a great time because like the industry has noticed that actually some games can be relaxing. Games can be like reading a book or, you know, games don't have to be, you know, it doesn't have, I mean, those are fun too, but obviously, but like, Couldn't agree um, more. and, uh, you know, we're, we're finding uh, a lot of women like unpacking, which is fantastic. It's refreshing. You know, the, the discord is full of, full of friendly women talking to each other, being supportive of each other. And, Those and games which that is, are an entry you know point I mean? to a new audience. You yeah, know, exactly. New... So we've, we've appealed to a whole other audience, which is, uh, you know, cause, uh, and, and, and it's been great. So I, um, and yeah, I think you're right that this game probably couldn't have existed up until now, you know, uh, because of that. And we are kind of realizing, yeah, it's really good to have, uh, some games that exist purely to just chill out and, and relax. Yeah. Well, congrats on it. Thank you. And, uh, Thank and you. Hopefully, uh, there's a slew of mixing and sound design <laughs> awards and things in your future for uh, it. Uh, I guess we'll see. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, congrats and thanks again for doing this. Thank you.